T2 stock is the topic of today's presentation. And if you're somebody that's invested in T2 biosystem stock or looking at T2 stock being talked about in the various communities out there, you'll want to watch this because it, uh, it's really an eye-opener. It's hard to imagine that a company like this would be attracting as much attention as it is. So first of all, you'll notice that it's extremely small. So the charts here from Yahoo Finance give a cursory look at what's going on. We have a company that's lost 99.8% of its value over five years. So when the intrinsic value of a company sinks that low, it's because typically management is incompetent. And you look here on the right, this isn't a firm that's just telling stories. So they're actually realizing revenues. You can see they had some growth, though, there it's, though it's stalled. Um, for us, the immediate takeaway is a company that gets this small. It, it gets that way for a reason. We have a market cap cutoff of $1 billion. That means we don't invest below that. Some of you may have lower thresholds, let's say $250 million or $100 million. But when you get down to around $15 million market cap, which is where it's trading today, then you really need to be concerned about how it got there. Now, first of all, we don't have a dog in the race here, not in any way, shape, or form. So we're not um, affiliated with their competitors. We weren't paid to write this. We're not short the stock, none of that stuff. The table that you see here, the search volume for this stock, that's why we're covering it. There's a lot of people looking at this company. And for reasons that we can't tell, retail investors are drawn to imploding businesses like moths to flames. So we're always keen to get in front of newbie, quote unquote, investors. At this point, they're speculators, but um, teaching them how to move from becoming a speculator to becoming an investor. What happens is that a lot of newbie investors see stocks this small as cheap, and that's a big mistake to make. So we're going to quickly today look at reasons why you should avoid this stock like the plague. Now, first of all, when you're looking at revenues, you want to see what sort of quality they have. And one of the ways to do that is by looking at your cost of goods sold. That's your gross margin. That shows your potential to be profitable in the future. It's okay if you're not profitable now. Most growth companies are burning through cash, but you have to show the capability of being profitable in the future. And you can see over the past trailing 12 months there that the cost of revenues uh, nearly equals total revenues. They don't have a business here. And we really haven't seen a company erode this much value so quickly, except for over-the-counter pump and dumps. But most over-the-counter pump and dumps don't have meaningful revenues. So intuitively, these revenues aren't good quality. But there's uh, more concerns that we have. So when you look at a company, always take a red flag approach. There's thousands of stocks out there. And even professional money managers can't beat a benchmark. So you really need to be careful about landmines more than you do rockets. So we like to take what's called the hiring manager approach. So when you're managing high-performing teams, one bad apple can spoil the bunch. And it's very tough to get rid of a poor performer. So you're more interested in avoiding poor performers than you are making sure that you hired some rock star. Usually you can tell the rock stars up front why. They know their value and they ask to be compensated accordingly. So when you're evaluating a lot of candidates, you look for reasons to file them in a circular filing cabinet, so to speak. Showstoppers, these are the easiest to disregard. So perhaps a, a candidate's inability to um, manage their proper language and, and correctly spell words on their CV is probably a good indicator they don't pay attention to detail. That's a showstopper. So two places we want to look for showstoppers for this company would be the latest 10Q and the 10K risk factors, because usually if something's going this pear-shaped, then the company has explicitly stated that in their risk factors. Now, this is a great question that's asked in uh, strategy classes to MBAs. What's the goal of every business? You'll get all kinds of ideas here, revenues, profitability. The goal of every business is to simply survive. So, this is what some companies need to do to survive. And I've never seen something like this before in the decades that I've spent analyzing companies. I've never seen dilution this dramatic. They gave away 97% of the company in a secondary offering. So just imagine what that felt 
like for existing investors who used to hold 100% of the company, but then ended up holding just 3% as the rest was sold for uh, what amounts to a very meager sum, and we'll touch on that. But one of the things when you start going through the 10K or the 10Q and looking at how this company plans to survive and the fact that they have a product that sells for a, uh, a, a very small gross margin means that they are probably going to need to raise more money. Well, if they already gave away 97% of the company, uh, it seems quite unlikely that they'll be able to do another equity raise at, at, at the, even the most remote favorable terms. Just look at the last one that they went through. But then they could also raise debt. But unfortunately, they're running into a bit of a problem there. So they have this term loan agreement with CRG Servicing, which requires them to maintain a minimum cash balance of $5 million. So whatever the cash they have right now, subtract $5 million from that because that's what's accessible for running their operations. And this second bullet point here, I've never seen this. The person issuing the loan, uh, the company granted them a lien on substantially all of its assets, including intellectual property. Well, that's kind of a problem. And this loan agreement, uh, what's reflected as $50 million in notes payable on their balance sheet, it comes due uh, next year, at the end of next year. And they say here there's no assurances they'll be able to refinance on terms favorable or at all. Indeed, that seems to be the case. They're running out of options very quickly. They also face another delisting threat from NASDAQ because their shares trade under a dollar a share. In March, they were issued a warning yet again. So this was a problem for them before. The answer was to reverse split the stock. That's why when you go back and look at that price performance chart, you'll see that that 99.8% decline that the original share price was, I don't know, somewhere around $900, just based on reverse splits. So lots of newbie investors don't realize that a split, either way, forward or reverse, doesn't do anything to intrinsic value. In this case, they're doing that, that reverse split, so they can stay listed on NASDAQ, and looks like they might have to do that again. Now, when you look at the amount of money that they're burning through, net cash used in operating activities, so that's what we look at, for firms to calculate burn rate. And you can see for the first half of this year, they burned through $25 million. All right, well, how much cash do they have left? That will tell us how long they can likely survive. Well, when you look here at cash flows from financing activity, so the item at the bottom there that says cash and cash equivalents at the end of the period, that's the answer to the question. Well, they have $16 million left. If they were burning around $25 million, uh, uh, so let's see, 25, 50 million for the entire year, then they have about, let's say, one more quarter before they're going to need to raise money. But this is quite interesting. So look at the cash flow. So proceeds from offerings there generated 29 million. So that, well, around 30 million more or less. Then the cash that they had at the beginning year was 4.7 million. And then the cash that they had... So actually, that's incorrect. It's the cash they had at the beginning of the year was $11.8 million. And then the net cash from all their equity raising brought in another $4.7 million, and now they have 16. So this company is in a world of hurt. They can't raise more uh, capital to run their business via debt or via issuing equity. I suppose they could, but it's an absolute mess. And then when you continue reading down their 10k and other risk factors it's at this point there's no what's the point of reading any further because this isn't a company we wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole but you notice they say things like well we had manufacturing problems in february that limited our ability to manufacture sufficient volume of certain consumable products to meet customer demand so they're not even able to produce their low margin products for customers that it, it's not even, it's just a mess. And they say we, they resume manufacturing. And to this extent, uh, to the extent we experience similar issues in the future, it could limit our ability to meet customer demand. That's a concerning statement. It's almost as if, well, we warned you that we're going to continue to have manufacturing problems as opposed to a message that might say, you know, we solved these issues. Don't expect them to happen going forward. Then you see here, this was something minor to note that, um, I saw mention of in other places their landlord sues them for 
terminating a 70,000 square foot lease in the Boston suburbs, and they had to pay somewhere around a million dollars to the landlord as a result of that. Uh, th- th- this simply shows incompetency when you you get in a lawsuit with your landlord. That's rarely a sign of uh, companies that are being run quite well. They don't let things like that happen. So regardless of who's right or wrong, they should be competent enough to figure that out at the negotiating table instead of having to go to court and waste everybody's time. Everything in this venture points to management incompetency across the board. And um, well, it's good here to see that the uh, key management players deducted their pay over year over the years. So you could see from 2021, uh, the head of the um, the captain of the ship here was realizing 3.5 million dollars in total compensation uh, for the 15 million dollar company he's running, and he dropped that to around uh, two million dollars for 2022. So it's good to see the, the management team here cutting back on their rich salaries in the face of a stock that's just absolutely uh, gone into the trash. Now, what it will attract are the meme stock morons. These are deluded individuals who think they're going to stick it to the man. So you'll hear hear them say things like, well, T2 short squeeze. And the truth of the matter is that no matter how much um, how much capability these individuals think they have in terms of moving the market, the house always wins. And the the saddest part here is that retail investors who get involved with this junk, they aren't learning a single thing about wealth creation being attracted to bankrupt companies is asinine in every way, shape, or form. And you see that a lot now for whatever reason. We should be rewarding competency, not incompetency. And the, the fact that that's completely backwards is just uh, its inexplicable. But until you stop being a speculator and become an investor, which means you don't reward incompetency, you're going to continue to live in the poorhouse. So be very wary about dabbling in these under the guise of being some BSD trader or because somebody on uh, some social media channel told you that's what you ought to do. Um, start investing in companies that have real potential. Don't bottom feed with incompetently managed companies. And you could say, well, maybe maybe they'll be acquired. That's never an investment thesis. And you could see how low they've sunk. This disaster of a firm likely won't be acquired. Who wants to um, deal with all that mess? Or if it if it does happen, it won't be favorable for shareholders. You can see how shareholders have been treated so well over the years by this firm. So um, there's a reason that companies become this small so quickly. And it just comes down to this. Multiple red flag showstoppers means we wouldn't touch this company with a 10-foot pole. So I'm going to put up another video here for you to watch. Before you watch that, please click the logo here on the right. Subscribe to our channel. Support our work. Thanks for taking the time to watch this today.